Hallelujah. Can we give Jesus a hand of praise? Come on, let's give Jesus praise. He's the one who really deserves that. Man, Jared just oozes swag. He's got swag goo sauce, man. I'm just so grateful uh, to be back here at Soul City. Uh, what a joy it is to see each of your faces. Uh, isn't it cool to see each other's faces? The Bible says that, you know, we see through a glass darkly, but then one day we'll see face to face. We've been looking at each other through masks darkly. Uh, and so just look at somebody next to you and just say it's good to see you. Yeah, they may not be that good to look at, but still, by faith. <laughs> Call those things that be not as though they were. And so, uh, listen, you all, I really am excited about the Word of God today. Uh, I really am so grateful for those of you that are in different places on the journey. There's some of you that are watching online and some that are even here uh, who may not be followers of Christ yet. Uh, and the joy of this ministry is that it is open to you. And we're so thrilled that you get to inquire, to investigate, to kind of come alongside. Uh, but our greatest prayer is that uh, this word of God today would meet you where you are. Uh, the Bible says that the word does not return. We sing it in the song. It does not come back void, uh, but it accomplishes what God purposes. And so it's a holy place to, to be. So can we pray as we approach the word of God together? Father, we thank you for the worship that's been lifted to your name. Uh, thank you, Lord God, for this uh, amazing ministry and the opportunities that it has to reach uh, the city and even the world. Thank you for the generosity of these, your people who give in so many facets and ways, not just fiscally, but time, talent, treasure. Uh, God, we pray now that your word would do what it always does, that it would be a lamp unto our feet, that it would be a light on our path. We cannot be uncertain and unsure with our steps when your word directs us. Speak to us, God. We are listening. And it's in the name above all others that we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I open up you all with a confession, and it's not something that I'm very proud of. Uh, uh, I, I um, had an experience with um, the Holy Spirit uh, that caused me to actually pull back and pump the brakes because of how weird he was being represented. Have you ever met people who were deeply spiritual but were extremely weird? <laughs> and you knew that they were spiritual. They weren't demonic. They weren't, you know, bad people. But you said to yourself, if that's what having Holy Spirit looks like, then I'm not sure if I want to go down that road. Well, you all, it didn't begin like that. It actually began very differently. I uh, went to St. Ignatius uh, uh, College Prep where I met my uh, high school sweetheart who is now my wife. We met in 1982. We've been together since 1982, got married in 88. Love at first sight. She saw me. She loved me. Amazing. <laughs> She's not here to tell us her version, but... Um, and so, you all, I was on this trajectory. My mom uh, raised me, a uh, single-parent mom. Uh, of course, Ignatius was not cheap. Went to Northwestern University after that and was kind of on this trajectory to become uh, a person who worked in the banking and finance industry. Uh, and so, after a toga party, uh, I, I was feeling very <laughs> philosophical. <laughs> It's true. Um, and I went out to a bridge on campus, and I began to cry out to this God that I had heard about growing up in church. In other words, you can grow up in church and still not know God. And I grew up in a church. I mean, as a matter of fact, I grew up with a black woman who church was like 24 hours a day almost. And I mean, so I was used to that, but I didn't really have a relationship with God. And so while I was in college, I remember asking uh, that night at about 1 o'clock in the morning, the, probably the most important question that I'll ever ask, God, if you are who you say you are, if you're real, uh, reveal yourself to me. And that night at 1 o'clock in the morning, he did changed my life and transformed me incredibly, changed everything about the trajectory of my life. Not only on that uh, bridge that I come to a saving faith in Christ, but I began to read the Bible from cover to cover over the next few days. I went to the student union and grabbed a room and said, I need to tell people what I just read. And over the course of the next couple of weeks, several hundred people were coming every day to hear me tell them what I had just read. And I said, I could do this all the time. And God says, you will. I ended up leaving Northwestern, going down to Dallas. And, and, and during that time, you all, as I was preparing and being trained in ministry, uh, remember those early days of your walk with God when everything was so fresh and exciting? Uh, remember when you were just excited about the opportunity to tell people about God? You, you kind of hadn't been taught out of things yet. And so you all, this freshness with God was so genuine and so amazing. Uh, my encounters with Holy Spirit was so intimate and so rich and so, so full. 
that I literally believed that uh, God was still alive and could do miracles. Miracles still happen. I had faith that healing and uh, signs and wonders could still happen in our age and in my life. I, I lived in that space. But then I met Christians who were weird. I became a pastor of a church and, uh, 20 years ago, and as I did, I, I started having to make some really tough decisions. Do I allow full reign of the Holy Spirit, full reign of Holy Spirit in the worship services and the possibility of weirdness, or do I try to control the environment? And to be honest with you all, I, I opened up by saying I want to share something I'm very ashamed about. I controlled Holy Spirit out of my church. There were moments where I knew that the Spirit of God was moving in some directions that were uncomfortable for me, and I didn't trust him enough, nor the people that were representing him enough to allow that to keep going on because I knew that there were people there that might get weirded out and may not come to faith or may not come back to church. So day after day, week after week, month after month, now soon, year after year, I found myself quenching the person of the Holy Spirit. Several years ago, I was invited to go to London to the Tr uh, Holy Trinity uh, Brompton Church for an Alpha Conference. They said, do you want to go uh, to an Alpha Conference? I said, I'm Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. Sure, why not? I had no, I had no idea. Seriously, I had no idea what it was. It's just London. All right, let's go to London. Uh, <laughs> it's the true story. Yeah. And you all, for whatever reason, God and his continued sense of humor with me, uh, allowed me to be the only black person uh, at this conference in London. And, and so those of you who are African-American or minority, you don't know how easy you have it in a majority setting, because when you go to the bathroom, no one notices, because it's just another white person that just left. <laughs> when you are the dark-skinned person that nobody uh, can't notice, where did Harvey go, right? So <laughs> it's true. So, so there's this moment, you all, where uh, the pastors of the church uh, are having this, this opportunity for us to engage with Holy Spirit. And you've heard this said here many times, uh, come Holy Spirit, and that's kind of where I first heard it mentioned in that context. He said, I just simply want you to just extend your hands and just simply ask Holy Spirit, come. And I'm like, okay, I've done that before. Uh, you know, I'll do it again. But, but, but in my heart, I knew how far I had strayed from my intimacy with him, connection with him. And in a very different and very meaningful way, I simply said, come, Holy Spirit. Next thing you know, I am on the floor on my face, uh, experiencing some time with God that I had not experienced since my college days. And you all, <laughs> all of these other pastors were not on their faces before God. But they were watching me on my face before God, and I could care less about what they thought and how they looked at me. Because in that moment, you all, my understanding of who he was, my trust of who he is, and my mandate to help people understand who he is increased drastically. And that's what I want to do today. I want to talk about him, and I want to kind of use this subject matter, which is going to sound kind of crazy, but it'll make sense. Uh, I want to talk about the cost of fuel has always been high. Now, I'm not talking about the cost of fuel at your pump. I'm not talking about the energy that you're paying for at your home. I'm talking about the fuel of God's spirit, which fuels transformation. If the mission statement of this church is that we want to help move people into a transforming relationship uh, through Jesus Christ, then we need to realize uh, what part of the, the, the Godhead, what, what part of God's nature is so pivotal in transformation. And you all, God is a triune God, God in three persons. You may know this. He's God the Father, God the Son, and God Holy Spirit, right? All three and all the same. I often equate that to like buying a value meal. Uh, when you get a value meal, you get an entree, you get a side, and you get a drink. You don't come back for the drink later. If you pay for the meal, you get the whole package. The Bible says that in Christ is the fullness of the Godhead. So if you have accepted Jesus, you don't have to wait on the Holy Ghost and come back through the drive-thru. If you already accepted Jesus, you have been reconnected with God through Christ, and you have now been endowed and indwelt with the Holy Spirit. You have him right now. 
And listen, you all, do not get caught up in how to identify him. Do I have him? Do I have some external gift that will now validate whether or not I have him? Do I have something that you can notice about how I'm acting or, or a gift that I'm displaying that can now verify the presence of the Holy Spirit? Listen, you all, you don't need an outward sign of that. You have been inwardly changed by God. And you have Holy Spirit dwelling and living on the inside of you. He is the fuel that fuels transformation transformation and change. Amen. And so you all, I want to just share some scriptures that will help us maybe get uh, an understanding of how all of this happens. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3 verse 5. I'm reading from the Amplified Version. It may read differently in your translation. Titus 3 and 5 says, he saved us not because of any works of righteousness that we had done, but because of his own pity and mercy by the cleansing of the new birth or the regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. It says that God saved us not because of anything that we could have ever offered or anything that we could have ever done, but, but, but by the work of the renewing of Holy Spirit, we've been saved. You all, it is, it is the work of Holy Spirit on the inside of us that actually transforms us. Now, you all, because of sin, what is sin? Disobedience to God, not doing the things that pleases God, right? Because of sin, mankind has been separated from God. And because of being separated from God, you all, there's this chasm, this huge gulf between him and us. And we needed someone that would repair that breach and bring us back into fellowship with him. Well, you all, it had to take someone whose blood, the Bible says, unless there's the shedding of blood, there can be no remitting of sin. So in the Old Testament, you all, you know, they had all these uh, different animals. They had goats and turtle doves and stuff. They had all these uh, sacrifices. And when they did that, the, the blood of goats and calves and sheep would, would simply cover the sin so that God could have some measure of fellowship with fallen man. So these people would have all of these blood sacrifices, and literally it would just cover their sin. It reminds me of how I make up the bed versus how my wife makes up the bed. I have a comforter. Anybody have a comforter? Thank God that you don't have to really fully make up the bed. You just pop that bad boy on top, and everything underneath looks right. <laughs> Nothing has changed underneath the comforter, but the comforter on top uh, makes it look right and acceptable to those that walk in the room. Well, sin had not been dealt with, but it had just been covered so that the holiness of God could have some kind of connection with us. But we needed something greater than the blood of goats and calves and sheep. What can wash away my sin and what can make me whole within? Nothing but the blood of someone that is not just a lamb, but the lamb of God. Oh, I feel it today. So, 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 oh, I'm, I'm getting ready to preach for real, for real. Uh, man, I ain't felt that in a minute. For real. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. All right. All right. So here it is. So, uh, Mary, uh, virgin, has a baby. You do know that's a miracle, yes. right? So, the Bible says the Holy Spirit overshadows Mary. She conceives a child unlike anyone else that has ever been born. Now, Jesus comes along, surging through his veins. It's human blood, but blood that has not been contaminated by sin. And so, he's able to live a life fully pleasing to God as a man. For the first time in human history, when God said, obey the Ten Commandments, we said, can't do it. Jesus said, I can. And he obeyed God and he lived a sinless life. And as a matter of fact, the moment we in this holy uh, season of Lent, uh, when uh, the, the, the people that were killing him said, we getting ready to take your life. He said, no, no, don't get it twisted. No man takes my life, but I lay it down. The Bible says that he became sin. Listen, do you think that a cross could kill God? Do you think that some nails and some Roman soldiers could kill God? Listen, listen, the wages of sin is death, and Jesus had never sinned. You cannot kill a sinless man. What killed him is when he became sin. He became your lies and my lies. He became your deceit and my deceit. He became your greed and my greed. He became sin so that those of us who only knew sin could experience righteousness and he who was righteousness he experienced sin so that we could be made the righteousness in Christ Jesus uh-huh and what does it have to do with Holy Spirit I'm glad you asked the father now who is holy because of Jesus who has now shed his blood and given those who would trust him the ability to have our sins washed away, whereby now we can stand and we can come boldly before the throne of grace and find favor in the presence of a holy God.
But guess what happens? Jesus catches a cloud and goes back to the right hand of the Father. And he says, guess what? I'm not coming back until the trumpet sounds. And then I'll come back and reclaim those who belong to me. So where is God, the Father, sitting on the throne? Where is the Son sitting next to the Father, interceding for you and me day and night? But he says, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm not going to leave you comfortless, but I'm going to give you somebody just like me. And he said, as a matter of fact, when, when I send him, greater works will you do. Because when I walked the earth, although I, when I walked the earth, even though I'm God, I, I was no longer omnipresent. <laughs> because when I poured myself into the container called flesh, it enabled me not to be everywhere at the same time like I was in my pre-incarnate state. But when I catch a cloud and go back to heaven, I'm going to give the Holy Spirit to each and every person so that I will be represented in the earth by everybody who claims to know me. So greater works will I be able to do through you than I could ever do when I walked in Nazareth in that finite area. So why are you filled with Holy Spirit? Grew up in the Baptist church. It's kind of actually Baptocostal, Pentecostal church. <laughs> and every single Sunday, every Sunday, the musician would get on the Hammond B3 organ and he would start playing some music. And then in the black church, they would call people start getting happy which means I guess they were sad before. <laughs> so I remember the music would start playing and just like popcorn, the people would start popping up all the church. I mean, I mean I'm talking about these old women would start popping up, a wig would go that way, a hat would go that way, eyelashes pop out. It must've been World Vision every Sunday because they'll be running. <laughs> and, 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 when, and why aren't you laughing? Okay, all right, so. So I was asking my mom, mom, what's going on? The music, she said, oh, baby, they just caught the Holy Ghost. I said, okay, great. Then the music would stop. And almost on cue, the same people that were jumping in, they, they gathered their hats and they gathered their hair. And they sit down. And I said, oh, wow, they must have thrown him back. <laughs> my view of Holy Spirit was emotion. My view of Holy Spirit was goosebumps. My view of Holy Spirit was some external something that somebody would do to prove that they had the gift of the Spirit. But instead, I missed the very reason for the person and work of Holy Spirit. Goosebumps are fine, but they are not the main purpose for his presence. He has been there, according to this scripture in Titus, to renew us. Romans 12 and 2, you've, you've heard this, Romans 12 and 2, hear this. Do not be conformed to this world or this age. Don't be fashioned after or adapted to its external superficial customs, but be transformed or changed by the renewing of your mind, by its new ideals and its new attitudes so that you may prove for yourselves what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God, even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in his sight for you. He says, don't be like the world around you, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You all, I, I saw a bumper sticker that I took odds with. The bumper sticker said, God is my co-pilot. Listen, you all, if God ever gets on a plane, and if God ever comes up in the cockpit and I happen to be the pilot, I'm not going to say, okay, now, Jesus, you, you know, just, just sit on over there because I got this, and when I need your help, I'll holler. No, 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 no. If God gets on the plane, I'm in coach or first class, whichever you prefer. Uh, bottom line, I'm not in the pulpit. I'm in the cockpit anymore. Why? Because if God gets on the plane, he is not there to assist you. He is there to take over you. And for many people, listen now, for many people, they believe that Christianity, listen, is adding on to me. I'm going to add Jesus. I'm going to add church. I'm going to add Sunday. I'm going to add religion. I'm going to add the Bible. I'm going to add God onto me. The way that I think, the way that I act, I'm going to ask God to help me out. God is not trying to help you out. God is trying to change you at the core. Hear this. Sin cannot be rehabilitated. Sin must be killed. And new life must happen. Transformation is not a rehabilitation of a sin life. It is a transformation by the very power of the God who raised the dead, healed the sick, and created the very worlds around us. That's who's in you. 
And he's there to change you by renewing your mind, by enabling you to do things you could never do. How many of us are in situations that God is requiring things of us that we just can't do? <laughs> Forgive those who hurt you. Well, how do I do that? Those of you that have been emotionally abused and hurt, you hear people say, oh, forgive them. How do I forgive them? You know what? I submit you can't. Not in your own strength. Okay, I'm going to appear to my better angels. Really? Those angels kind of come and go too much. There are many of us that are trying to rehabilitate things that are not meant to be rehabilitated. They're meant to be transformed. And so God has a plan and a strategy for this, and it's found in the scriptures. You all may know this verse because, uh, well, let me just build this, you all. Uh, Ezekiel 18 and 20, it says, the soul that sins is the soul that shall die. Romans 3.23, for all, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Listen, you all, all of us have sinned. Every last one of us. I don't care who you are. Every one of us have said. That's why you can't judge another person. How can a person of dirt judge another piece of dirt? Just because you got Gucci dirt, you know. <laughs> I got Gucci dirt. I live on the north side dirt. You still dirt. <laughs> All have sinned. And because God is holy and because God is pure and because God is perfect, how do sinful us communicate and connect with holy God? How, listen, how do we do God-sized things with sin-filled capacities? How do we do the things that God requires of us with sinful minds and sinful bodies and appetites, sinful pasts that haunt us? It's through transformation that it happens. John chapter 3, very famous text. Nicodemus, one of the uh, great elites of the Pharisaic uh, kind of people, came to Jesus at night knowing that if he went at daytime, he would be judged. And this great ruler of, the, ruler of the Pharisees, kind of this legal mind, went to Jesus and said, I, I, I see the things that you do. I know that nobody's like you. H how, do I end, how do I get eternal life? How do I connect to spiritual stuff? Jesus said, don't, don't be amazed by this. You must be born again. Here's a response that he gives to Jesus. It says in verse 4 of John's Gospel, chapter 3, How can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus said? Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb and be born. Notice him trying to understand spiritual things with this finite, carnal mind. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and of the Spirit. Watch this. Flesh gives birth to flesh. But the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. Jesus responds to Nicodemus' question of how do I engage in spiritual stuff? How do I get eternal life? How do I connect with God? He said, listen, that that is born of flesh is limited to what the flesh can do. That that is born of flesh can only interact with other things like it. Those that are born of spirit, however... They then birth things that are spiritual. Mm. Which means, listen, if you are not a child of God, all you can do in this life are birth more fleshly things. All of your actions at work, flesh actions. All of your parenting, good parent, but not born and not led by God, even with good parenting, it's not spirit-led parenting. Flesh. And he said that that is born or birthed or that that comes from flesh will only reach flesh. But that that's born of spirit, it will reach and it will be spirit. Look at this next verse. It says, all who received him to those who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. I love this. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or of husband's will, but born of God. I love that scripture in, in John's gospel, chapter 1, because it says that, that those who are born of spirit, their identity is not just connected to their human descent. You all, I believe that one of the joys of being a part of the family of God is that our ethnicity in him is not, is not only your natural descent. We're trying to figure out this race thing. Can I tell you the answer to this race thing? 
God thing. Because in Christ, the blood of Jesus has made us one. There's no division. There's neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, rich nor poor, slave or bond or free. In Christ, we've all been made one because we have been born of the same spirit. And what an answer for the world, isn't it? Listen, can I tell you something? Jesus said, Jesus said, prayer, I pray that they, us, would be one the same way you and me are one. It's a serious prayer. Then he said, so that Chicago will believe you sent me. He said, I pray that the people who follow me will be so united that the world will know that you sent me. How will the world know that God sent Jesus when they see us doing something we could not do unless we had the spirit? The reason that God is calling us for a higher life of God's spirit is so that a world that is far from him, that doesn't believe he's real, will know there must be a God because I know you cuss people out. And you don't cuss people out no more. Come on, don't look at me like that. Your kids are like, mom can flip the bird in a minute while she's driving, but I ain't seen a bird at all in the last five months. Must be a God somewhere. I'm making jokes of this, you all, but transformation becomes evangelistic. Could, 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 could we ever maybe make the connection between the falling away of people from the church and the lack of the fact that people in the church have not been transformed? Can, 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 can we ever connect the dots? Oh, there seems to be an incredible decline. For the first time in American history, uh, we're in a post-Christian America. What an uh, what a astounding uh, fact. How do you think that happened? Could it be that the folk that were in the church never got changed? And the folk that were outside of the church looking for God to show up in the lives of the people that were going every Sunday never saw a change? But could it be that the people that were coming to church were trying to add, I'm being loud, she just put her hands on her ears. She did. Before I take it back, I'm going to get louder. Listen, you all hear me well. Could it be that God has been looking at the church to show the world what changed lives look like? Transformation is not just a motto on the wall of this church. It is the fundamental principle of being a believer in Jesus Christ. Is there anybody in this room hearing me? Well, in the two minutes and 40 seconds that I have left, Went to it. Don't, don't tell a priest. Don't do that. Don't do that. So, you all, whether you know this is, this is God's power to change. So, uh, I was invited to a church in, in, in Indiana uh, several years ago. A friend of mine was called to pastor this church. During Black History Month, he was preaching a sermon, and uh, he was talking about Dr. King. The church got incredibly silent. After it was over, when he went to one of the deacons and said, hey, man, I, I just, the church seemed to get really silent when I talked about Dr. King. He said, well, yeah. He said, well, what's going on? He said, well, we don't like black people here. He said, why don't you like black people? He said, because they're not fully human. I said, is that what you're thinking? He said, is that what you're thinking? He said, no, that's what we all think. That's why when the black people moved in, we moved our church to another location because we don't want to be near them at all. He had to decide whether or not he was going to stay there or not. He chose to stay for the next two years, teach them that black people were human. The church had a vote. We affirm that black people are human beings. Therefore, they possess a soul. And so that was a big milestone. He said, now we need to get a preacher in to come and preach to these people. So guess who they brought in as the first black person that they had ever had in that building? They said, we prepared a, a wonderful dinner for you, lunch for you. I said, I'm fasting. They came with a little water. I'm like, oh, bottle water for me. I don't know where y'all are on y'all journey with this thing. <laughs> so I got up, and I was just as loud as I was today, sweetheart, just loud preaching. 
Got to the end of the sermon, a lady in the front row had to be a thousand years old. <laughs> White lady said, come here. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, I've never been this close to one of you. Never thought I would. But you sure did preach the gospel today. So you put those big old black lips on this white face and give me a kiss, would you? I said, yes, ma'am. And in that moment, that woman who had been stricken by the sin and the demonic spirit of racism, by the power of the transforming presence of God, got delivered of her racism. Jesus is still the hope of the world. Jesus is still the hope for Chicago. All right, let me finish this. So let me finish. So what happens when you have Holy Spirit? He gives you the power to do what you couldn't do before he showed up. So that when he does it through you, you know it wasn't you. And everybody that knows you know it wasn't you. So the glory and the credit doesn't go to you. So as I get ready to close, we're going to do two things. First of all, I'm going to tell you why I get so loud. And then secondly, we're going to say, come Holy Spirit. You all, I have seen people fill stadiums with people who they don't know. I've seen people shout and get loud and paint their faces and hug strangers for people that have not done anything for them. But I told the brother when, he, when I was coming in that a few years ago I was in hospice. Do you hear me? The doctors told me you will never walk, eat, or do it. They gave me a feeding tube and sent me home to die. 80 pounds, could not walk, could not speak. And they say, if for some reason he ever gets better, the calcium deposits have depleted so much in his body that his bones are too brittle for him ever to move. Oh, but you better hear what I'm saying to you. God told me about one o'clock in the morning, get up and go get something to eat. I said, don't you understand that my muscles are in atrophy? I haven't moved in eight months. But when God gives you a word, then with that word comes the capacity to do what the word says. If God says, oh, God. If God said, get up to get something to eat, I got up and got something to eat. And now I'm in the American Journal of Medicine as an unexplained phenomenon. So if you think that I am concerned about my volume, if you think I am concerned about how I look to you, you were not there when God is there anybody here? God has been good to you. Then let the redeemed of the Lord say something. Uh huh. Remain standing. Listen, we're going to pray. We're going to pray. And we're not going to get, we don't need emotion for this one, but it may happen. Because somebody, you've been hurt so bad. You're going through therapy. Your self-image has created health problems. You can't trust and your relationships are broken. And yet God tells you to forgive. Others of you are in addictions. And no matter what you try to do to break them, you can't. <laughs> Turn the other cheek, I have no more left. How do I do these things God is asking me to do? It comes with his capacity. He wants you to die so that he can live. So I'm just going to simply ask if you would to just, if you feel comfortable, if you don't, don't have to do anything with your hands, but would you just extend your hands just in the posture of, God, I receive, but I also give. And we're just going to simply, in a few seconds, say, come, Holy Spirit. And when you do, don't tell him how to show up. For some, it will just be a calming presence. For others, it will be 
joy. And others, it'll be a gift that he imparts, a fruit that he develops. But one thing I know, you can't call on him and he won't hear you. So would you, with outstretched hands, just simply say, come Holy Spirit. God, thank you so much for meeting my sister where she is. Thank you for meeting my brother where he is. Holy Spirit, let's not put you on the sideline. As a matter of fact, when we talk to you, God, we're not going to forget talking to you, Holy Spirit. We talk to the Father, we talk to Jesus, but we rarely mention your name. Teach us to remember you. Thank you that the fuel of your presence has cost the life of our Savior. But thank you that he still lives. And now he lives in us through you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you so much for watching the Soul City Church YouTube channel. So glad that you made the time to be able to hear today's message. My name is Fabi. I'm the worship pastor here. And if this message was a blessing to you, I would encourage you to like it, to share it, and to even to subscribe to the YouTube channel so that you can get up-to-date videos and get to know what's going on around here. Uh, for more information about Soul City, about giving, service times, live stream, you can get all that information in the link below, or you can visit soulcitychurch.com.